today for me to introduce um, Henning uh, Rasmus to, to you from Paragon. Um, not only do I um, count him as one of my dearest friends and colleagues, but also he is probably the most infectious and energetic person I know, um, and it doesn't matter which and what he takes on, mostly and sometimes to the tiring uh, of all of us. <laughs> uh, Henning is also a graduate of WITS, which I think is important to note, um, and he has always viewed his training and travel as symbiotic, and this is displayed in terms of always working and studying, um, and while studying, working in places like Berlin and Hong Kong, uh, and even further into as a young architect. Uh, in the late 90s, he, together with Ant uh, Oralovitz, established Paragon Architects, setting off uh, on a journey of growth and expansion of a practice with vast impact uh, on the architecture in South Africa, um, but also uh, all over Africa and beyond. Um, we are definitely awaiting to hear from Henning uh, and also the latest sort of inventions. And therefore, over to you, Henning. Thank you very much for participating. I think you can share the screen now. Okay. Uh, Patricia, if you can just undo that. Is it there? Not yet. Can you see it? Can you see it? No, just try again. Okay. No, not yet. No. no. Strange. Okay. Let me restart it. Not the computer, the presentation. Okay. It was working earlier. Can you see it now? No, oh, sorry, no. I know it was working earlier. Have you maybe disabled it from your side? You said you had ever written it. Patricia, can you just have a look at yours as well? Here we go. Okay. Okay. Can you see it now? No. Are you sharing the wrong thing? There we go. That's it. Okay. Thanks, Ina. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ludwig. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you to the School of Architecture and Planning uh, for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, thank you for everybody who's in here. It's nice to speak to a large group of people without a mask. Um, and uh, I'm going to climb straight in. I can talk a lot, but I also do have my timer on somewhere here on my phone. Um, it's, an, it's an astounding time uh, to be talking to a bunch of architects. Um, I've titled my talk Curiosity and Empathy because they're two values or qualities that interest me, and I think some of the people in our company I'm really talking to you as Henning, the architect in my personal capacity. Of course, the work that I'm going to show is done by Paragon, not all by me. But I firmly believe that architecture is a form of spending your life force and that the architecture we produce is a record of the extent and the way in which we burn ourselves up while we live in this life on this earth. Um, I promised Ludwig, who's a good friend of mine, that I wouldn't use the F word. So this is the only time I'm going to use the F word is on the slide. Um, I have been known to use F words in lectures, but apparently that's not good with the dean listening in. But really, this slide uh, does uh, very much talk to the condition we find ourselves in. Eight billion people on Earth have been rained on. And I think if, uh, uh, if change is as good as a holiday, we all on one massive, substantial holiday right now. Um, 
Speaking as a designer, and I always like to make things a little bit entertaining, I mean, I think some people are having proper design crises at the moment. Um, astounding, things have ha ha astounding things have not happened in the world, and designers are impacted by that in different ways. Um, I love this logo design, just wanted to share it with you. I must excuse, uh, I must ask for your permission or your, for your... Uh, for for your condonement of me using some memes, we all live off memes, I think, at the moment, and sometimes they're the only thing that gets us through the day. But uh, the the most uh, maybe the most arresting realization for me as a businessman architect has been that all the guys, all the mainly white guys in suits who wanted to be known as disruptors, are suddenly quiet. Because the disruptors that the world has been talking so much about in the last few years are not guys in suits, not white guys in suits, not other guys in suits, but a little pesky virus that looks like a ball with some spices stuck into it. Um, we went into this crisis as a country with one of the worst hands of cards that we could have, having been stolen blind, blind and bankrupted by a ruling party that promised us this for the last more than a human generation. And so the, I just wanted to put this out there because I think we are in, a, in, in an amazing time of change in one of the most exciting times to be alive because we can, change is washing over us and any, anybody who has wanted change can activate it now. And I'm just bringing that up because I said that architecture has spent life force. Those of us who are angling for change and always said the conditions weren't there, while well, the conditions are now there because a lot of things are changing. Um, I've been reaching deeply into my own toolbox. I found this drawing, you know, as one does, you do house, house maintenance and house cleaning in the first two weeks of uh, lockdown. And I found this drawing done by my daughter probably nine years ago. Or so she must have been five or six years old. And um, I think this is a highly emotional time and I take architecture for me quite personally. I like to talk about it in an up close and personal way. And I think we are all in an emotionally churned up time and that is great for the architecture we are all producing. I think we are all super switched on and our senses are super switched on. I think we all got in touch with at least the prospect of our own mortality. I don't dwell on it much, but I have been thinking a lot about it. I've been going to coffin designs. There'll be more about coffins later in my talk. And this is a coffin designed by Egon Eiermann, one of my famous set of post-war German architects. Did beautiful furniture and an exquisite coffin for himself. And one of his main clients was a funeral institute in Germany. Um, so I think um, we've all been looking at graphs. We've all been looking at maps. We've all been redrawing maps. I'm just throwing this in here because it is a context for the talk and the kind of extreme madness that we need to get through this. Um, I think for me, who's always been on the plane for the last few years, talking about emotions, my baggage has been very emotional. But with that, I want to get to the more serious part. It's been a good time of introspection and actually getting asked by Ludwig to um, join this lecture series with some of my best um, colleagues and fellow practitioners has been a huge privilege. I've been looking into myself a bit and thinking for myself what this is actually all about. Because it's nice to see your name up on a lecture poster, especially if it's your old university. I had a great time at WITS. I still think back fondly on my time there. It was amazingly inspiring and my time there still inspires me in my work now. I'm a happy architect, I'm a happy practitioner, I love practicing architecture. It doesn't mean I don't have bad days where I wish I was on the beach or somewhere else, but actually architecture has been amazingly um, uh, satisfying to me. But I am only what I am through other people, and Paragon is made up of these exquisite people. I want to share the kind of some of the life force behind Paragon with you. This is a video of a few minutes. It comes from our um, uh, Christmas party at the end of last year. I Some hope the sound works. The world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. 
but if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice.
And with that, I have to move on. And then we burnt the year down. We built this, uh, we built with, together with some of our subcontractors, this six, seven meter high architectural sculpture and set it on fire in the Victoria yards. And maybe it was amazing to cleanse the year that out that way because we had no idea what was going to come in 2020. But I wanted to share this with you because really this is what Paragon is. And that's the company that I have built together with very great partners over about 23 years by now. And so um, the, the question for me in my career a few years ago was, where do I actually want to be? And I've gone on a personal journey to get outside of my comfort zone. It's taken various forms. But uh, basically, I believe that uh, there's no point in being an architectural practitioner, in fact, of being a human being, really, if you work hard to create a comfort zone and then spend your life there or a good section of your life. I believe that life is only worth living if the magic happens next door and you are on a journey there. Um, so I'm not the comfort zone guy in Paragon, and I want to share some of the uncomfortable spaces I've gotten into in the last few years of practice, mainly in continental Africa. They're not always success stories, but uh, architectural practice is not about success stories and pretty drawings and shishi and look ma, no hands. I want to start with a project that has been uh, award-winning for us. We're not known as hotel architects. But we got invited to this competition in Swaziland by a South African developer working for the pension fund of Swaziland. And it was one of those things where we went, ah, this is never going to happen, this project. Just the ingredients seemed wrong. And we said, listen, if we're going to design this building, of course, on risk, we never get paid for the sketch designs we do. Let's do one for the portfolio. OK, this is probably not going to get built. But hey, here it is, because sometimes you get that call. And that crazy thing you did for the portfolio does end up being a building. So um, this is a just over 100 room business hotel. We had this idea of designing it with the rolling hills of Swaziland in the background. It's quite a clear object. I mean, Mbaban has got some pretty cruddy architecture. I'm sure a few of you on this talk will say that this is just another cruddy piece. But um, we um, went on quite a journey building this building uh, for a local pension fund who had done some rather less ambitious buildings before. Um, it is uh, not um, what you should do with hotel windows because there's all sorts of problems with the curtains and the blinds and so on, but we didn't quite know that when we started out. We don't know everything. We got into a bit of retro design. It's got this really rough plinth and then this object building on top. But what I really want to share with you about this building, and it goes to my interest in, in empathy and curiosity. We So we are these architects and we work with our consultants in Revit and we do this 3D modeling and we draw these incredible sculptural shapes that through value engineering on a lot of projects we've learned to do and we believe are buildable anywhere. And my, let's say, journey in Paragon is to see if I can do or if I can cause buildings to happen in markets that are less sophisticated than South Africa as a whole on the continent and to see whether we can build similar things with different in different settings. So we do all this modeling and then we get to build this thing. And the guy who built these incredible skylights and all the ceilings in this hotel is really um, a, quite a character. And so I wanted to share this video with you. Of a building site, your social standards, everything drops, you are equal because you can't get this building up without the lowest neighbor dipping that trench over there. When you leave the building site, then you can go to your respective status, eating prawns instead of sheep, and that sort of thing. But yeah, it's a togetherness. Otherwise, you fall flat. Alan, we're going to drink lots of time. Where did you learn? Yeah. Where did you learn this? I mean, you're a philosophical man, but who? No, how did you get to this insight? No, it's it's there all the time. People don't see it. It's there all the time. And then feet on the ground, always feet on the ground. No, it's, it's easy. You see what happens? <clears throat> if two people are playing chess, they're so engrossed in the game that the guy standing on the outside can see three moves ahead 
and it applies to everybody. You can have what knowledge and what uh, degrees and all that sort of thing. It's how you apply what you know that's important. Of a newspaper. And another clip by Ivan Patterson. Whoops, sorry. Of a newspaper, you need the whole newspaper, the full newspaper, so you can go through it and you can actually see what the recognition is up. And, and in that way, you can feel more comfortable. The trick is to see around the corner, which is physically impossible but you must be able to see around the corner because that corner and that corner falls in love on a burning soul. And then they start to courtship. And by the time when they want to go into this silly thing called marriage, they find they're not compatible. For the simple reason that you weren't looking around the corner all the time as you walk around a burning soul. And in that way, you will eliminate a lot of assets and a lot of headaches. So, um, and then uh, 15 minutes later, we were in Ivan's office and he showed us his own coffin that he had made. He had been through, I think, nine cancer operations. I'm not actually sure if he's still alive. That video is probably from 18 months ago. And he was going for his 10th cancer operation. And he showed us his own crafted coffin in his own office made with fresh wet cloth. So this is why I get out of bed to do my work. Of course, I'm a director in Paragon Architects and we have to feed the sort of 95 people every month that you saw in the video a moment ago, or they help us feed themselves through Paragon. But um, I, I found, uh, I was very inspired by the lecture on Monday of this week um, in this series um, about the workers who make our buildings. So if I say I, I only do what I do through other people, we as architects, do what we do through other people. We need to see around the corners, as Ivan said, and we need to understand, we need to have respect for the people who make the things that we want to see built. I wanted to share this with you because it is these kind of stories that inspire me. It is this kind of conversation, listening to this guy on site that makes me happy and that makes me feel that I am not an important guy, I'm only a part in the machine and the machine takes many players. And then, yeah, there are these colorful moments. This is King Mswati III opening the building. I mean, what a day. It's a lot better than a bunch of suits from a property fund um, who kind of, uh, you know, sometimes don't open the buildings at all. So um, this is just some of the uh, some of the things I wanted to share with you. Then there are kind of, of course, really strange journeys in the same kingdom with the same king. We were asked to do design a new parliament. The, this was a competition. We spent, I don't know how many people and how many weeks um, doing a bid for these buildings, these object buildings, this incredible extensive brief, a hundred and hundred odd thousand square meter brief for the parliament of a tiny um, kingdom in Africa. And of course, the whole thing was a smoke screen. The job didn't go ahead, but basically there are lots of smoke screen tenders. This whole thing was a waste of time. There was a, a East European architect who is related to the king's family who had already been given the job. So we get burned, we make mistakes, we get a hiding, but hey, maybe this is one for the portfolio and maybe we can use some of these ideas somewhere else. So we go on journeys and we try and push, we try and push the edge. We, do work in a strongly sculptural way. We do believe that a building silhouette is an important thing. As my Angolan clients always say, a building's got to be lookable. So um, one of the subtexts of this lecture series was university design. I put this university in because we, we talk so much about clients. I mean, we got paid here for a university in Ghana and I really never met my clients. So, so we spent so much time about client and client interaction. I didn't speak to my clients once in this process. Um, this is a university outside of Accra in a private estate. It's basically inside of a gated community. Lancaster University is a global university brand launched by an Indian businessman out of Dubai. And they go to Ghana to build a university in a gated community. 
the client representative was a military guy, an Indian ex-military officer, a sergeant major, who sat with me through design meetings, and we fleshed out the brief together, and we, I, I, I got, I, I was talking to a military guy about urban placemaking, and he just, I don't know, he came from another planet, but, um, so we dabble in these things and we try and do everything. Paragon's always been a generalist practice. We never wanted to be choosy. We'll do just about any building type. Maybe not for just about any client. There are, there are ethical and moral boundaries, but we have always said that we will touch every building type that we can get our hands on so that we can be fully skilled architects. If you want to specialize in South Africa or in Africa, you could very quickly run out of food in your fridge. So the, these long purple buildings are really housing blocks. So it was a university with student housing. Just a brief that was that was made up. The brief was far too ambitious. By the time we finished the master plan, the budget, the the budget, well, the cost was five times the budget. The budget came from a discussion that this military man had with his um, with a, with a contractor over a beer. It turned out later. I asked him up front what his budget was. He went, no, we don't have a budget, just design. Luckily, he paid us. But we make mistakes. Should I have asked more than once? Yes. But we ended up designing this massive campus only to find out that the clients had thought this was, would cost exactly 20% of what it was going to cost. So we move on. Um, I just wanted to share that. Then, of course, in Zoom, uh, to get to design methodologies, we design whole projects at the moment without ever meeting as team. This is a student housing project in South Africa. We didn't meet once, not with the clients, not with the consultants, not with my team. We do this all by Zoom. Revit on Zoom with Sketch over. And it's an amazing process, actually. Um, I'm loving lockdown. I have much more time for design. And we're having a good time just, uh, just learning to communicate differently. Just wanted to share that with you because it's not all Zoom and Gloom. It also can be quite an empowering process. Um, I want to get into a little bit of detail into this project in Nairobi, in Manyani. Uh, Manyani is just the name of the road. This is a head office for a small oil and gas company, individuals who are trading oil and gas in East Africa. It's a steeply sloping site in these beautiful suburbs of Nairobi. We um, have great partner architects, a company called Design Source that we do almost all our Kenyan work with, and they really connected us to this client. And uh, this is a continuous learning and exchange process with great partner architects in Nairobi that I, in turn, learn a fortune of in the process of doing buildings together with them. So this is a, really a private office in a garden setting, um, and Nairobi has these beautiful suburbs we uh, work a lot with these 3D modeling to and, and 3D compositional drawings to do the client communication. In this case, the clients do build quite a lot. They build filling stations and fuel depots. Um, but really, it's the service coordination. It's the difficulty of the service engineers. I mean, the quality of professional services on the continent is by and large not up to scratch. And in Places like Nairobi, for example, the structural engineering can be really weak, just over-designed and clunky. So we end up doing all the 3D drawings, issuing drawings like this to site for information, constantly hand-holding. We have a Kenyan architect in our office, Edwin Seda, who has found his own methodology of communicating and who constantly and constantly works with these 3D pictures to in detail handhold and help our consultants get through this work. Do we get paid extra for this? No. Do we believe the investment is worth it in the long term? Yes. I mean, we literally, we take the renderings and then we strip the skins away and we compare the finished model to the service model, to the structural model, to communicate to guys where the clashes are. So there's a whole other language that comes out of these drawings and I love that drawing on the left because it really is like this peeled away body, skin substructure, skin drawing. And we use these on sites in meetings. We issue them with drawing packs for construction because we have to. If we don't do that, we will not get the quality built that we are aiming at. So um, the, the documentation is super intense. Um, lots of practitioners are in this room. You might go, yeah, we also do that. That's fantastic. But 
um, really the documentation and the, and the annotation and the notes and the handholding you have to do and the red notes that you have to put on in red and make sure they print out in color so that people really read the instructions. So you issue your drawings which are instructions and then we write instructions on the drawing on how the drawing is to be read and what is important in the drawing because we've learned time and again that the drawings just don't get looked at and you have to you have to issue notes to, on how to read the drawing with the drawing. So this is life force. If this is life force, do we lose money on a job like this? Yes, of course. Are we building long-term relationships with consultants in Kenya that we can do our fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh building with? Yes. So this is what I mean by life force. This is what we do. This is what individuals make up. Edwin made this methodology up himself. It wasn't my idea. This is what I mean by I work through other people. So I might be heading from Paragon, but if I didn't have an Edwin, and if we didn't have other people in our office um, who do this work and engage in their work personally according to their methodologies, we would not be completing the work that we complete. Um, we do this, these, uh, this coding, we try and do these perforated screens, we're getting into coding, we're getting into parametric modeling, to, to enable these things. And then the sites are rough. They are super rough. Okay, It's a whole other thing of scaffolding and technology and the accuracy of the concrete edges. And these fights are universal. These conditions are everywhere in the world. And this story is the story of every architect in every country, in every economy. I just uh, wanted to get out of my comfort zone and see what I can do in places like Nairobi after Paragon got reasonably good at doing certain things in Joburg. And again, we are only one type of practice, and we chose to practice in a certain kind of generalist way. There are many valid models of practice, and the world's a big place, and luckily there's a lot of choice of practice. And I think sometimes as practitioners, we are too critical of each other about the choices that we make of how we want to practice. This I never thought I would be a director of Paragon Architects. I never thought I would have uh, six business partners. I never thought I would employ 95 people. I never thought I'd be doing, be involved in some of the biggest buildings on this continent, but here I am. And certainly life has been good and peachy, but it's been because of our willingness to go just about anywhere. And we were never choosy. Um, another building in Nairobi, again with design source, a 23-story tower. I'll tell you up front that our client's bank got liquidated when we had cast the structure to 14 floors, so we're not sure whether this building will ever finish. But um, the client wanted this, uh, this really tall vertical building almost as a, as a tombstone for himself. He was a 73-year-old retired ex-cabinet minister. And part of the journey was the, the, uh, that, gr that gray sort of perforated screen that you see at the bottom of the building has his family's crest in it. The family has a crest and the father of the family, the patriarch, wanted this family crest in the building. So we looked at various ways of doing that. We got into this, this, uh, this crest with this eagle. We went to this perforated screen. We started modeling that. We work, we, uh, so that was just a fraction of the facade. This is again um, BIM modeling in Nairobi with consultants who have never heard of this. The first proper unitized facade system in Nairobi it was all detailed, all done, all ordered, all the deposits were paid and then the client's bank got liquidated and the money stopped. And it might be a 14 uh, story high tombstone for me, Henning, who went to a city and try to ride a tiger and we couldn't pull it off us and our co-architects but clients fail i mean in south africa there aren't that many stories of client failures but clients across the continent take huge risks and they are hugely exposed to much weaker transactional and banking systems and so things can go wrong again just full on 3d 3d elements for everything so that people understand what you want them to do we literally detail out every connection and in Revit and increasingly work on BIM platforms and markets where this hasn't been heard of. So that's burned life force. Then, um, yeah, sometimes the sparseness of the site office is, is really quite uh, endearing. There's always tea in Kenya. There's tea time with sweet tea and cookies. 
and it's a big story. You walk around in white coats, you get white coats and gum boots, and you look like a bunch of medical scientists walking around your site. Um, but this is really a proper disaster project we did with another architectural practice who had won a huge housing estate with a mall, but they had never done a mall. So they, I had met these architects at a conference and they asked me to help them out with the mall component. So I love this clock that sat in the site office because this was halfway through the project. It took us four and a half years to build a 24,000 square meter three-story mall with a B-grade contractor in a, in a building contract with no penalties of any kind and uh, worse conditions. So really they are, it's uh, incredibly, incredibly slow sometimes. I never was patient until I started working outside of the country. I used to be quite an impatient guy and my work has certainly changed me over the last year, uh, over the last few years. Um, but we went into this project for a pension fund who had never built a building in their life into a large project of about 400 million rand of value, 100% equity funded, no debt, no banks, taking pension money from families and burning it all on one property project. And it didn't go well and the contract was signed up without any penalties, without any input from us for sure. And there we sat, day 710, halfway through a 24,000 square meter building. This building in South Africa would take no longer than 15 months to build. It took us 54 months and the quality is really quite shocking. But here we are. I said I would also talk about the failures. We try and we get some things right. Maybe halfway through this building looked reasonable. This is what we sold to the client. This is what it looked like a part of the way through construction. So none of this is easy. None of this is easy. Um, the way things get done and the way, um, especially in Kenya, um, the, the large dominant Indian owned construction companies and Indian owned material suppliers stranglehold the industry and stranglehold clients leads to a very low level of trust and that ends up in quite difficult buildings. Kenya is a, is a amazing, Nairobi is an amazing economy, but it's a difficult, difficult place to deliver quality. Um, I'm just sharing these pictures because, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, between the picture, generally we, did, we go from the picture to, in reality, something that's close to that, but this building was quite different. Um, but it is there, now, to, now for the really shocking part of the story. Um, so this is the mall finished, finished, handed over, snagged, but we can't get a road to it. That housing development you see in the background put together by a Chinese developer had no sewer connection. So that housing development in the middle background built a 1.8 meter big sewer pipe across the front of our building, simply built a sewer pipe above ground for all the people who live in those apartments across the front entrance of our site and without any approvals and cut off our site. And our clients had to go to court. The biggest pension fund of uh, Kenya had to go to court three times to the high court to remove the sewer pipe and they were defeated and lost. So we have this entire shopping mall built with cash by a pension fund, which cannot be opened. It doesn't have a single tenant in it. And the client has taken a huge bath. So it's rough out there super, super rough and never a dull day. So have we all burned life force to get this mall opened? And here we are. It's marooned, it's finished, and it's rough. But these things happen and um, it is, uh, I think South Africa is in comparison to many African countries, the big easy. I, I, I'm not saying our work in South Africa is easy or our clients don't work hard and they don't take hard risks, but it's a rough, rough terrain out there. Um, onwards to better things, we are working in new cities. This is an office building in Tartu City, a new city across the continent. New cities are getting built to get out of the infrastructure collapse that generally befalls African capital cities. Um, yeah, international, global capital master plans being done in London. And then we have to right size these, uh, these projects to the local market. Mm. 
um, other apartment projects. So the classical projects are these kind of things, luxury houses for immigrants or, or for, for what they call the diaspora investors. So rich Kenyans who invest back into their rich Kenyans, rich, rich Nigerians, rich Ghanaians who invest back into their countries for their families, for their future. Um, other, this is this is classical. Um, uh, this is in Ghana, classical diaspora investor product. We finished this a few years ago, and yeah, we we tr I, I tried different things. We tried different things. We sometimes get astounding things built that we couldn't easily get done in South Africa. I don't think this would be easy to do. It's really hand formed concrete edges to these to these balustrade walls, hand formed concrete. So while the concrete is still wet, it gets de shuttered and then finished by hand. Amazing processes. A lot of hotel work. This is a strange project in the foreground. The orange object is a Freemasons temple. The Freemasons uh, are commercializing their sites. So our client, instead of as part of the land purchase, has to build them a new temple. So here we are doing a business hotel and a Freemasons temple, never a dull day. It's fascinating to see the inside of a Freemasons lodge. And so, yeah, never a dull day in, uh, in the kind of way that the projects are put together. We do a lot of the facade, let's say, rationalizing with quantity surveyors, in this case, South African quantity surveyor, to strip out the layers, to work with the rates, to rebuild rates from scratch, to get a handle on the costs. Um, so that we empower ourselves and don't get manipulated. Um, this is uh, another hotel in Accra. Um, uh, really, uh, to put it in perspective, I met this client first in 2013. It is now 2020. It's currently the biggest project in construction in our office. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we work with local artists. This was working with Marcus Neustetter from the uh, Trinity Sessions on facade artistic schemes that may still get implemented. Uh, we get the president to open the buildings. As always, the model gets finished at the last minute on site. And you get these great ceremonial things. The president of Ghana came to open the site. And this is about 18 months after construction starts. It's a 44,000 square meter building and uh, it's being built by, by a Lebanese construction company and we're finding it not so easy to communicate. But um, I mean, there are great opportunities. You have to have a lot of patience. You have to, I mean, I do probably, probably 40% of my total work effort is development management and not architecture. Do I get paid for that? No. Do I take clients who have never done a building? This client has never built a building and the first building he does in his life is the biggest job in town. So this is not going to be easy. We started the job without a project manager. So a lot of my work is actually development management and turning non clients into clients. They're great people. This client in particular, very erudite guy, an economist by training, studied at MIT, but he's never done a building. So to take him from no building to 50,000 square meters is extreme. I'm putting this little building on because this is again in Ghana, one of those new cities. So we get a new city. There isn't a building around this for about 1,4 kilometers, but we get an urban designer's plan which has this build to line with a kink in it. And so for this first building, we do this weird object because some urban designer came along and decided that this is gonna be a whole city with perimeter blocks. So here's a piece of uh, new urbanism in the middle of the bush in Accra. Okay, there's nothing around this building for 1,4 kilometers, but we have to build to this build to line and we get our designs rejected because our building is 600 millimeters set back from the building line. So sometimes you really wonder what you're doing and what people are smoking. But yes, I mean, from a South African perspective, we also have a different size, sense of adjacency. And we often can't believe that new cities can actually come out of nowhere. Tough little building, rough budgets, not much money, and great ambitions. Uh, just very quickly, I need to finish. This is a lodge project in Botswana. Uh, we did this in a competition. This was our first COVID victim. We did this in a competition against four other architectural practices. And then in January, this thing already got cancelled because of COVID in China. We started working with uh, mud brick, so earth packed construction, um, sourcing local, local different forms of soil and stone. 
and got into this very earthy architecture and, and earth ramped construction. It's something that we're interested in exploring, especially for hospitality projects. But yeah, not everything happens. I'm not sure if this project will ever come back. Not sure what's going to happen to the uh, hospitality industry. Then this is probably one of our biggest growth centers, data se growth, growth sectors, data centers. We do them mainly with engineers in different countries, in Lagos, in Botswana, and uh, with everybody working from home, this is a large, large sector. Architects are not necessarily the drivers. Nothing here is about, nobody are really asks what the building looks like. We get in there because of our Revit and BIM skills, and we work with engineers to, um, to really do the service coordination. And then, yeah, just to close off, this is literally from last week. We were involved in a slave root museum in Ghana on a private safari estate. It literally is on a physical slave route, and we're just making this thing up as we go along with a client who sits in London, all on Zoom, no meetings, and in the middle of nowhere. I've never seen the site, and we, uh, we yeah, it's interesting to work in this, uh, in this time of COVID and to have this abstraction. So with that, um, I know it's sometimes overwhelming when you're a, a student and you're talking to a practitioner who makes it all sound so easy and it all looks like, man, how am I ever going to get there? Don't be afraid and don't be afraid of the changes that come with COVID either. I often use this slide to end my lectures. Um, I wanted to encourage those students on this call, just look forward to a great time. Architecture is a fantastic career. You just got to insert all of your life force into it. And with that, yeah, just wanted to thank Vitz again. This is a picture of my retina, and I like sharing the things that I see. And with that, over to Ludwig. I hope there are some questions. Yes, thanks, Henning. Um, I'm sure there will be. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, thanks, Henning, for that um, uh, sort of broad uh, sweep across a variety of projects and insights. Um, we generally do open up for some queries and uh, questions, and um, I will allow some to happen um, uh, from 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 some of the panels. Uh, but maybe I'll start from my own. I think it was quite insightful the the last image. Uh, which is showed as a museum, um, yeah. as, um, as a contradiction to some work that you've done uh, previously or we've shown previously, that there yeah. is something about commercial architecture that you've been doing that seems to be, um, in a way, normative, in a sense that it is... Um, it feels as if it re repeats, doesn't matter what the place is about. Yeah. So there's a systemization of a product. It uh, doesn't matter where you are, if you're in Swaziland, Nairobi, or maybe in Santon, as an example. Whereas maybe the more um, civic building, or maybe in this case a museum, mm -hmm. suddenly has a completely different character to it, just from the one image. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe the question or statement is, how do you actually approach uh, place, place relevance from an architectural point of view in terms of its... How do, how do you make it distinct between what is in Mombasa and what is maybe happening in Santon and, and or uh, Nairobi? Sorry, not in Mombasa, yeah. Nairobi no. and or Swaziland. There are two perspectives on it. In fact, maybe the surprising thing is that building is not that, dif not that different across the world. It can be in certain forms of practice, but actually... Let's say commercial buildings are made are like concrete is concrete, steel is steel, glass is glass, you know, and, and then people do come to us because of our portfolio. For better or worse, Santon is uh, Santon, where we have done much of our work, and South Africa, again, for better or worse, is a model of something. I can't tell you in how many meetings I've sat, but dozens and dozens of them where everybody wants a Melrose Arch. And so people come to South Africa, these African clients come to South Africa, they stay in places like Melrose Arch and they want one of those. And they want to know if we were involved, which we were in the first phase. And so they think that we are the right architects for their work. Part of, our, part of the reason why people come to us is because of the work we have done. So we can try and depart from it, but also clients want a Paragon building. 
Um, I hate the word iconic, but people come to us because our work is iconic. I can't tell you in how many briefs that word appears in the first line. They go, we want an iconic wada wada wada, yeah, therefore that's why we're coming to Paragon. But the, the bigger problem of how do you make something local if you go to the material culture is many, many of these African capital cities just don't have a manufacturing industry. So much of these buildings is imported that they're not Ghanaian materials. I can't even get Ghanaian timber in Ghana. Can't get. Okay, can only buy it from Europe at one hell of a price. So the global system, and this is one of the one of my great hopes about COVID, is that parts, even if they're small parts, of the global procurement system will collapse and that we will stop trusting in getting everything from everywhere. Because it's a great lie that we've been made to believe that we as architects have the right through our clients and their money to get just about anything from just about anywhere at just about any time. Same as the kiwi fruit that we eat that comes from New Zealand when we should be getting it from Mpumalanga is a lie and ends up as a carbon footprint and a melting planet. So we often, like we, we work with foreign materials in almost all these places. Almost nothing gets made in Mbaban. Almost nothing gets manufactured in Ghana, but in Ghana, I can get everything from Italy and Turkey and Spain. Um, so so a, lot of, a lot of the materials just aren't local. And it's when we go outside, when we go to remote Botswana, when I go into the bush in Ghana and I do this museum, that I suddenly go, well, now we far from anywhere. We're even far from Accra. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, but it's, it's what we represent to clients and what we can't get. And manufacturing is one of the great stories. It's a big story for South Africa. Does that answer your question? Well, it's probably a topic in its own, uh, on its own, I would imagine, rather than just maybe just answer it briefly in a question. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's yeah. a bit unfair. Yeah, um, sure. Can I please have some queries from the, from the, from the panel uh, by way of show of hands? There are so many of you. I sometimes struggle to see all of you. Um, so please, can someone? Table something. But you see, people become very shy because they are now confronted with so many other people. Two hundred and sixteen uh, people. There must be a question. Throw a virtual tomato. <laughs> Someone. <laughs> okay, there's, there's a hand. One. Who's that? Hi, yes. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Is it? Hello. How are you? Fine and you. Good. All right. Um, I just have a question, especially for that development that you did. I believe it was in Kenya, the one where you built, you designed the whole mall, and then handover mm -hmm. came about, and nothing could have been done further. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to talk about mainly the responsibility of the architect's office at this stage, where normally going as far as having a full development being made and at the end yet, it can't really be handed over due to technicalities, because at the end of the day, that's what it stands as. Yeah. Wouldn't normally the clients will have turned towards you and ask you, why didn't you do your, your work a bit further in terms of just clarifying those small pieces of information to make sure that project can be completed because technically the project is not completed uh, maybe because I may be worried about that part yeah. normally yeah. the architect would be asked why they didn't complete their work quite carefully no, no. I mean our, our work is finished there was no way that either architect or paragon could have foreseen that a neighboring client would build an illegal sewer pipe across the front of our site when when we were three quarters through construction they built this while we were building after we had started building cut our site off and and there, there are other issues with that site. So so we, you know, and 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 again, malls in Kenya are quite different. It's illegal in Kenya to sign a lease for a building that isn't physically finished. So in South Africa, the whole shopping mall thing is about signing up leases before you start building. You don't you don't start digging a hole in the ground for a shopping center in South Africa until at least 70 to 80 percent of the leases are signed. In Kenya, because of property law legislation, it is illegal to sign a lease for a building that doesn't exist. 
So in Kenya, you have to build the whole mall until you can, before you can start leasing it. So just that little piece of difference makes a fundamental difference about shopping malls, for example, and when you start building them. So uh, that's, that's a, maybe a part of an answer. Um, could I have foreseen the problems? No. Could I have protected my client? No. Is this a, a, a cluster problem as per my second slide? Yes, for all of us. It's not great. It's not great for my reputation. I couldn't have foreseen it. It's not great. This is Paragon Architects first building in Kenya and it cannot be open. There's more than one reason. The sewer pipe is one of them. But is my work finished? Yes. Can I do anything more for that client? No, I can't. Nothing more I can do. Nothing more I was in for else. All right, that's all. Thank you. <clears throat> There's a general shyness about all of this. <laughs> or either I'm not seeing the, the hands. Heading up, think it because we we try to stick to the hour uh, most right. most of the time. Heading yeah. again, I, I mean, I can't thank you enough for making the time and effort to share with us some of your experiences. Um, I th I think also um, there are such varying um, uh, impacts that we have from 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 commercial architecture all the way through um, to some of the more civic buildings that we always profoundly push at university level. But there is a different reality, and I think those realities somehow uh, brings us to earth. And uh, I think that is quite refreshing from your side. Um, I thank you again. I think these things are recorded. Um, I think the um, and um, thank you also to your office in terms of of sharing some of that work to Ant and the, and the rest. Um, and yeah, and we hope and trust to see you soon again uh, to share us with stuff. I think uh, from our side, just to conclude, I think Patricia is going to share the um, the, the front cover page um, and to, in terms of the CPD registration, just so that everyone can maybe follow on that as well. All right. I, I see a lot of hands have come up again. I don't know if you want to maybe field those. Um, um, but I've got that. No, so we can, there's a, um, Ash, I think, is one. Hi. I don't know if you hear me. Yes. Hi. No, just um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I just wanted to have your take on um, what you sense the the future of um, of the architecture will be, obviously post COVID. Now that the senses everybody's working a lot of people are working from home and um i just wanted to take uh get a feel for what paragon um view is in terms of you know the, the history of the buildings that are that were coming up in santon and what what kind of change we'll be seeing in places like santon and big cities do you think it's a temporary pause or there's going to be a significant shift no, I, th I think the, the, the cultural shift in the working world is profound. I, I don't want to go back to my office. If I can do one day in the office uh, from now on, I'll be happy. Um, I, I think the world of work has been fundamentally impacted. Um, we will be repurposing office buildings into whatever, just like we will be repurposing malls um, into whatever, partially because of COVID, partially because of online retailing. Um, there's a huge or there's a huge amount of refurbishment and retrofitting and rethinking re-engineering work coming because these buildings are there. A lot of them haven't been paid for. Um, there will be clients who fail. There will be property funds who fail. You just need to look at the sh at the share price of the South African property funds. Um, that include some of our clients. It's going to be a long and hard recovery. Where are the companies that, that are going to take up the big leases? Again, I, I think we, we so, so watch that space. Your generation will, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm assuming you're a student. Your generation will still be picking up the pieces from this current crisis. We are luckily as a practice no longer that exposed. A few years ago, office buildings were 70% of our work. Now they're probably 30% of our work. But there will be a huge amount of 
of innovation and thinking that will go into rethinking them. Can we put universities into shopping malls? Yes. Why would we build new universities if we can put them into dead shopping malls? Do we have dead shopping malls? Sure as hell in the next few months they're going to float to the surface. So um, it's quite an exciting time. I, I don't want to speculate. I think it's too early to jump to conclusions. But the world of work has been fundamentally affected across the globe. And it's great. It'll reduce the global carbon footprint. We can all spend less time in traffic. We will all travel less. Um, we will all have better family life. We will also all have more family stress if we have bad relationships. Um, there will be a lot of investment in house building in South Africa as people build home offices in other countries. So there's, there's opportunity in everything. Everything in life has a light and a dark side. So the light side of COVID is what we are here for, not Paragon, we as architects. The world is changing and this is a fan fantastically exciting change. It's not pleasant, but what a change. We, could have, we couldn't have wished for a bigger shift and it came from a tiny little bloody virus. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Enid, for seeing the positive and everything. And I think on that note, <laughs> uh, I think for that, I'm going to I'm going to conclude the session because we've gone over our hour. Thanks again for your trouble uh, and your insights, and uh, we we are looking forward um, to the next session as well. And please join us for that. Um, sure. It's by Peti Morigeli uh, yes. from MMA, and that's next week Thursday, same time, ten o'clock here uh, on the same sort of uh, platform. Um, again, the, the, the screen is up with the CPD links for everyone to share. Uh, and then I'm wishing you a good weekend. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Cheers, Henning. Thanks. <laughs>